I'll, I'll save a bit of time by uh, skipping my intro. So there you go. Thank you. So uh, I am another researcher, even in fact doing the same PhD as uh, the wonderful goddess of Thrin Brains, Thrin herself. Um, so, so that's me. But my real qualification for being here and talking about this is this. So um, this is my daughter. This is Bryony, and she's two years old. So this is when she's about two. She's two a bit. That's when she's five days old. So I wanted to talk about um, parenthood and how parenthood is represented in games. And can we really play? So I said, you know, let's play mums and dads. But the question is, can we really play mums and dads? in video games. So I started thinking about it and I thought, mm. so there are some games where, so th th there's quite a lot there, and there's some games where it's fairly superficial. Um, you know, and uh, Parenthood is there, GTA 5 or Octodad or Metal Gear Solid, but you know, I wouldn't really say that counts for these purposes because um, it's not really engaging with what it means to be a parent is represented, but that doesn't mean it's really engaging with the idea and the concept of it. And so you can start to look at things like, at a very lowest level, Papers, Please, which in a way represents more about parenthood by not representing uh, your family than it does by doing so, uh, as with so many things in Papers, Please. But again, you start to make those decisions, but it, it, it's, it's creeping in. Now, The Last of Us, I would say, the reason why it fell flat for you is because it's not really about family, because it's a zombie survival game and one massive escort mission. That's why. <laughs> so don't feel bad. Okay. So uh, whilst I do like that narrative, though, about the surrogate child, etc., it doesn't really... Um, yeah, the, the fact that Ellie is not only invincible as an escort, but she's also invisible. Did anybody ever find that? Like, she's totally invisible. Like, goes, oh, where are they? Where are they? Eddie's right there. Can't find him. So, you know, it kind of breaks that sort of parenthood thing. Um, I find, actually, one of the best kind of narrative representations of uh, parenthood is in Heavy Rain. Now, much as everyone, uh, some of you have got the desperate urge to go, Jason, at this moment, you know, that, I have to say that even before I had a child, that scene kind of really got me. Maybe I'm sad. But you know, I really felt that. And to go back and play that scene now, because it, it, it is a parent's worst nightmare um, to lose your child in a public place like that. That really is it. Uh, one of your biggest nightmares. Um, it really does take that. But you know, games can do a lot more than this. Because where games really come into own is when, they make, when you can make significant decisions. And that's a David Cage game. So there's no significant decisions to be made. So, a really good one I find is one of the characters in Cart Life. So, I can't remember the name of this character. This is the girl who has to go and get a coffee stand. She's a recently divorced wife fighting custody with her husband. And she's trying to sell coffee on the street to show that she can make a living. And she's got to juggle all these things uh, in order to make ends meet. And Cart Life starts to really get at some of the root of being a parent because you start to make significant decisions. And they're not just decisions that affect you, but they're decisions that affect other people that depend on you. And that's something that really changes, that you don't really think about too much, actually, um, before you have a child. You know, unless you've had dependence before, and I didn't. I was never a carer for my parents or whatever, but it's those kind of decisions. It's a similar kind of thing where you make a decision and it affects other people around you. And then you look at things like, this is Gravitation by Jason Rohrer. This is the game I think he made after Passage, the next one after that. And this starts to highlight, not only can you make significant decisions that affects others, but it's also a conflict of interest in some of these things. Um, in Gravitation, this is, it can be interpreted in multiple ways. Some people interpret it about bipolar. Some people have interpreted about their creative drive and managing creative instincts. Um, other people uh, interpret it about family. That would be the more kind of surface level interpretation, I would say. Because you've got little kids you can play ball with, and then your creative urge strikes and you jump up into the skies. But if you jump up into the skies and collect points and the rest of it and do that for too long, by the time you come back down, that kid's gone. It's just disappeared. There's no sounds to mark that. There's no great big cataclysmic, oh my God, your child has gone. You just come back down and they're gone. And this starts to talk about the conflict of interest, you know, where you're trying to balance your own needs versus the needs of other people around you. 
And actually, my personal favourite, which doesn't do it quite so well with as well with mechanics as gravitation does, but kind of does it well with simple mechanics and with narrative, is the novelist. Just out of interest, because a lot of people would have played all those other games. How many people have played the novelist? Two. Okay, so that's that's fine, that's fine, but I highly, highly recommend the novelist. It's quite a simple game. You play the part of a ghost who um, is in a house. That's all the game is. Like It's just in a house, and you're watching this family, two parents and one boy. Uh, they've gone there for a summer retreat, and the guy is the titular novelist, and he's trying to basically get through a creative block and get on with his life. And he, through... And then, and then through the game, uh, I won't go into the mechanics, I don't have time, but through the game, you're helping the family kind of make decisions. And there are real crunch points where he makes a decision, um, and it's normally from his point of view, because he's the novelist, about does he spend time with his kid? Does he spend time with his wife? Or does he sort of like sacrifice something about him for, to benefit his wife? And he doesn't really come out in the mechanics at the end, so I wouldn't call it a proper mechanical representation. Um, but... They have real, it does really make a change to the narrative and how you feel at the end about how well you balance things. So, you know, games can really start to dig into parenthood so much more, I feel, than film or comics or literature, etc. Because obviously you have a role to play. But the thing I would really like is that parenthood could be so much more than conflict and decisions. Um, you know, there's negative and positive things. You know, games can be quite good at modelling, like I sort of referenced before, that what I call parental dread. Um, we just and you you do get this parental dread, and you just have to push it down. Basically, you just learn to live with it. You learn to just suppress it. But something that's quite well represented, I feel, in Ico, because if you leave that girl alone for two seconds to do her own thing, she is often being snatched by those black ghosts. And it's annoying, but with the hand-holding mechanics and if you have to put up, put up all those uh, platforms, you come to really care for this, for this whatever she is, ghost. We don't, we don't know, do we? But you, know, we, you come to care for this girl spirit thing. Um, and you, you're, you're worried when you can't see her and she wanders off, it's like, uh, where is she, what's she doing? That only goes halfway. Or, you know, something I'd really like to see covered is just the eternal guilt that you are made to feel by the media and the consumerist press, whether it's people trying to sell you something or people trying to justify their choices as better than yours. Yes, I'm particularly looking at you, anti-vaccine campaigners. Um, you know, like, you're constantly made to feel guilty and then you're always doing the wrong thing as a parent. And whilst we are here... I just like to say, you try and find a picture that involves a man in that kind of situation, and it doesn't exist. Because everyone talks about a mother's guilt. And in the 21st century, I find that very frustrating. Uh, because in my house, my wife is the main breadwinner. She's a finance director, and I'm a student. So, you know, I am the kept man. And, uh, and I take equal care of childcare and house stuff, as she does. I find it very frustrating that it's always the woman. It's like a double-edged sword, you know. Um, why is it always that it's got to be the woman? Stupid. So, again, we could do things with games like that. Uh, um, and just to qualify, that was me doing Movember in 2015. But it was the easiest photo to cut out and put my face in that I could find. So, more positive then. Like, we could, you know, think about was it to convey in a game unconditional love? You know, the kind of love that you get when your child is both being good and being bad. And so, um, if you've never changed a child's nappy, my, my daughter here, at about 18 months, is covered in pseudo creme, which is what you put on a child's arse crack to stop it getting nappy rash. And she, uh, she, my wife was in the kitchen, she was off playing. My wife noticed, it, see, it's not the noise that you worry about, it's when they're very quiet. And Brian, he was very quiet, and that doesn't happen very often. She was very quiet, and uh, my wife went in to find that she had basically just covered herself in pseudocreme and the carpet took mums to come out, um, etc. But um, that, was, that was just before she got hosed down like a like a refugee or like a uh, like a prison person in the bath um, under duress, um, or the pride that you 
the pride that you feel in every little step they take, like their first words and their first roll, their first rolling over and their first crawling and their first walking, which isn't anywhere near as bad as people say it is. Like it's, it's actually great because it means you can take them more places a lot more easy. You don't need to take a naffing buggy everywhere. So, but it's good and you can play with them more. It, it's fantastic. And every little development that she makes, you really, really love. And by the way, knuckers is a Yiddish word, and it's the only kind of word. It means pride in the achievement of others, uh, particularly in your children. Yiddish is a great language, very guttural kind of emotive language, uh, and you can't find an image for it because there's a place in America named after it, and that's all you get. Um, so, yeah, so those kind of things we can model in games. Um, we really could, you know, parenthood can be so much more than conflict or just the comedy value of children. So we've already seen that. You've already attested to that with those lovely faces that your nieces were putting. Um, so the comedy value, you know, children are just so fun and they're very spontaneous. I, I couldn't really find an image for spontaneity. So I had to just Google the word woo and uh, that's the best I could come up with. But, you know, they are so spontaneous. And, you know, to reflect back on what Thrym was saying earlier, their concept of play is just not moulded by anything. They, they truly do not give a shit. Like, anything is fun. And it doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense. Uh, my, my daughter is very good with language. She talks a lot. I've got no idea where she gets that from. And so she talks a lot, and uh, which is interesting because most children of that age don't talk a lot until they're much older. But now you get to see inside the warped, disjointed patterns of a two-year-old's mind. And believe me, it's very difficult to follow. But it's hilarious sometimes. Like I think that now that I think of it, ad libbing here. Like sometimes you're changing. I used used to be changing, and for a while, I was like, "Poo comes up your bum. Planes go up in the sky, as if they're connected somehow." Never understood. Yeah, they are hilarious. Or the responsibility that you feel, like when they're first bought. Yeah, that is me um, with her, and she's just under six pounds. She's a very small infant. Um, the, the responsibility that you feel and, that, and that, how that really hits you and it really changes things. These are all things that we could do so much better in games. Or the fact that parent is just not black and white. It's messy. And whilst we can have rules, we can have emergent rules that illustrate that messiness and um, the fact that very few things are set in stone and are truly good and bad. And there's, everything has a positive and a minus and contraindication. And everything is always in flux. It's always changing. And as soon as you get used to one thing, it changes again. All these things can be really well modelled in games, I think. So basically, in the same way that parenthood can be lots of different things, I also think that games about parenthood could also be lots of different things. And they don't just need to be about conflict and, uh, and choices, etc. They can be about lots of the positive things as well. Mm -hmm.